Hey everybody, this is AP Macro 2016 FRQ, question number one. Let's get to it. It says, assume that the United States economy is currently in short-run equilibrium. Okay, so short-run equilibrium, we're not on our LRPC, we are not on our LRAS, right? We are not in long-run equilibrium. Um, with an actual unemployment rate above or greater than the natural rate of unemployment. So our actual rate of unemployment is greater than our natural rate of unemployment. Guys, that means we're in a recession, right? That means we have cyclical unemployment. If the actual rate is greater than the natural rate, we got cyclical unemployment. We are in a recession. We have a recessionary gap going on. Draw a correctly labeled graph of both the long-run Phillips curve and the short-run Phillips curve. Label the current short-run equilibrium point, point B. Okay, so we've got the Phillips curve model here. The big thing about the Phillips curve, guys, is what is it showing? It's showing the relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate in both the short run and in the long run. So let's get this labeled. This is the inflation rate. I'm not going to abbreviate because I don't want anybody to ever put interest rate there. This is inflation rate, and this is the unemployment rate. That's the whole key to this model. In the short run, what's the relationship between these two? It is inverse. When one goes up, the other one tends to go down. So we're going to write short run Phillips curve. That's showing the inverse relationship. In the long run, there is no relationship. This is my LRPC. There we go. LRPC. Where is the LRPC anchored? It's anchored at the natural rate of unemployment. So again, our actual rate of unemployment is greater than our natural rate of unemployment. We're on the right-hand side. We are always on the SRPC, always on the SRPC. We are not always on the LRPC, and this is the case where we're not on it. We're to the right, put a little dot right there, label it P. Again, we're in a recessionary gap. The right-hand side of the LRPC is a recessionary gap. Now, I also put an ASAD model because when I do Phillips curve questions, I like to always just make sure I know what's going on in my ASAD model because I like to link these two models up. So just very quickly, let me go ahead and get this one up to speed. I need to put my LRAS curve. Remember, we're in a recessionary gap, which means my LRAS curve is to the right of my equilibrium output. Okay, my LRAS is to the right of my equilibrium output, right? This is how much we're producing right now. Full employment output, YF, is of course greater. This is my LRAS curve. The problem is not asking us to do this, but I like to do it. I like to make sure we've got this down. Here's where we're actually at. That's where our economy's at. Again, this distance is the recessionary gap. We're in a recession. The left-hand side of the LRAS curve is the recessionary gap side, okay? So, recessionary gap, right-hand side of the LRPC, left-hand side of the LRAS. I think we got all, everything done for A and a little bit more. B, assuming no policy actions are taken, will the short-run Phillips curve shift to the right, which is upward, or left, uh, shift to the left, downward, or remain the same in the long run? Explain. Now, let me just talk about the right, left, upward, downward thing. So, for this short-run Phillips curve, it's not, it's not like a supply and demand curve where you need to say right and left. For the short run Phillips curve, guys, you can talk about it shifting right or upward, okay? That's the same thing. They're equivalent, right and upward. And you can also talk about it shifting left and downward. Those are also equivalent when, it become, when we're talking about this uh, particular model. So they want to know what's going to happen to the short run Phillips curve in the long run. Now, of course, in the long run, we always adjust back to our long run curves. I'm going to start over here really quickly, okay? This is the one I think most kids are most familiar with. Recessionary gap, I mean, I've got cyclical unemployment, as we've already said, we've got the excess of available workers. And what we want to understand when we're talking about the long run is what's happening to nominal wages. So that's why I'm talking about workers, guys. And excess of workers means the price of labor is going to go down. Nominal wages are going to go down. That's a cost of production going down. When the cost of production, which is wages, that's a major cost of production, goes down, our short run average supply, which is our short run total production line, going to shift right, right? It's going to increase. And what would happen is we would end up going right in here. There's my SRAS. This would be my new equilibrium point. And then I just want to kind of think about this for a second. Well, if we go from E sub 0 to E sub 1, real GDP is increasing. We're producing more, meaning the unemployment rate is going down. So guys, from this point P, I need that unemployment rate to decrease. And then we can see we got downward pressure on the price level. 
the ASAP model actually shows deflation. Now, guys, I want you to know that, first of all, it doesn't have to be deflation, even though that's what that model's showing, okay? Um, if we're ever asked, yes, it's saying deflation, but in the real economy, we might just get disinflation, okay? Remember, it's a model that doesn't show things perfectly, okay? But definitely, what are we not getting? We're not getting inflation. I think that's the big thing I want you to take away right now. Here's what I'm trying to say, guys. This axis and this axis, inflation rate and price level, are not the same, okay? But they are generally correlated um, uh, positively, meaning if we go up here, we generally go up here, we go down there, we either stay the same or go down, okay, for the most part. What does not happen, what will never happen is we're never going to go up in this model and down in this model, okay? That's the big thing. So, what am I going to do? I've got to go to the left from where I'm at, and my inflation rate basically needs to stay the same or go down. Technically speaking, when we talk about a long-run adjustment, the real place that SRPC should be placed is right there at the same level. Remember, it's not showing the inflation rate going up at all. That's the technical place where it should be drawn. But guys, if you put your, remember, if you satisfy those two arrows, great. If you put your dot there and your SRPC down there, that will work 99.9% .9 of the time. SRPC, sub zero, sub one. Guys, which way is our SRPC going? It's going left. Which way did our SRAS go? It went right. And that's, that's also something very important to know. When SRAS goes right, the SRPC is going left. And if, you know, of course, if the SRAS went left, the SRPC would go right. Here's the key, guys. AD shifts in that model, we'll move it along, along an SRPC curve. SRAS shifts in that model, SRPC is shifting in this model. So, which way did it shift? It shifted left. What's the explanation? Because I know we want to make sure we got that explanation. All about the nominal wages, okay? And I'm not going to mention the SRAS, okay? I might say nominal wages are going to go down, SRAS is going to increase, and this is going to definitely uh, reduce the unemployment um, and have downward pressure on the price level, causing the SRPC to shift left. I think that works really well. Again, anytime you ask for an explanation when it comes to the long run, talk about the nominal wages. Always talk about the nominal wages. C. If the Federal Reserve Bank wants to lower unemployment, what so this, I guess it's kind of like an instead, right? So if the Federal Reserve wants to lower unemployment, what expansionary open market operations should it use? So three tools of the Fed. We've got open market operations, open market operations, discount rate, and required reserve ratio. C, they're already targeting us at a specific tool. The most common tool the Fed uses, open market operations. And here's what the Fed can do. It can do open market purchases of assets, okay, or open market sales of assets. Okay? It wants to lower the unemployment rate, it wants to do stimulative policy, it wants to stimulate borrowing, so what it's going to do is open market purchases. What that means is it's going to purchase like assets, the asset we should normally think of as U.S. Treasury bonds from banks, so that it can put reserves in the bank. It's going to purchase something from banks and pay those banks with reserves, pushing reserves into banks, and what are reserves? They're basically loanable funds, trying to get more lending, trying to drive the interest rate down. Okay? trying to increase the money supply. So open market purchases. D, how will the open market operation you identified in part C affect each of the following? The federal funds rate. Now guys, the interesting thing here is they're asking for an explanation. So I'm gonna give you the full answer. The first thing I wanna say though is, guys, we're doing expansionary monetary policy. Again, we're increasing the money supply, putting reserves in the banks, getting interest rates to go down, okay? And the federal funds rate is just an interest rate and generally speaking, interest rates move in the same direction. Federal funds rate's going to go down. So that, let's get that out of the way. Federal funds rate's going to go down. The explanation, I think, is interesting because they don't generally ask for an explanation. But to do that, I'm going to take you over to my federal funds market. I just broke up, I did a little segment of my board just for the federal funds market. You'll never have to draw this market, but here's what's going on. In my federal funds market, I've got the federal funds rate as being the price of federal funds, quantity of federal funds, supply, and demand of federal funds. What's happening in the federal funds market? Banks are lending to each other, okay? Why are they lending each to each other? Some banks have excess reserves. They can lend those out to banks that are deficient in reserves. So suppliers of federal funds have excess reserves. The managers of federal funds have become deficient. This is like overnight lending that's taking place. Well, if the Fed puts reserves into the banks, guys, that's actually going to increase the number of banks that have excess reserves. And it's also going to decrease the number of banks that are deficient in reserves, okay? 
So what's going to happen to the federal funds rate? It's going to go down. That's what I would say. You don't have to draw it, but if I was given the explanation, when the Fed puts reserves into the banking system, guys, the banks that have the number of banks that have excess reserves is going to increase. The number of banks that are deficient reserves is going to decrease, driving the federal funds rate. Because what's happening there? Again, reserves are being lended between banks in this over mar overnight um, market called the federal funds market. So the federal funds rate, as we knew from the beginning, is going down. Moving on to D2, the real interest rate um, in the short run. So what's going to happen to the real interest rate? A couple ways to approach it, all right? So one way to approach it is this. The nominal interest rate equals the real interest rate plus the inflation premium. So what is happening to the nominal interest rate? We know for sure what's happening to the nominal interest rate, right? If you look at a money market, the money supply is shifting to the right, driving the nominal interest rate down, okay? Now, when the Fed pushes money into the economy, guys, what's going to happen to the inflation rate? Remember, they're pushing money into the economy, trying to drive more spending, right? More demand for goods and services. The inflation premium should go up. At the very least, it's not going to go down, right? So we're going to get either an increase in the inflation premium or it's going to stay the same. It's not going down. So what's going to happen to the real interest rate? It has to go down. Again, like I said earlier, 99% of the time, guys, interest rates move in the same direction. There's a couple other ways that you can talk about why the real interest rate is going down, but this one works for this problem right now. They're not asking for an explanation. E, given your answer in part D2, the real interest rate's going down, what is the effect on real gross domestic product in the short run? Explain. All right, so I'm going to get rid of this. Remember, we're doing Fed policy. We're not leaving this thing alone. We're shifting AD, okay? Yes. Fed policy is just the money supply curve, but in this graph, it focuses on aggregate demand, total spending. That's what the Fed is trying to do, is increase total spending. So they're shifting the AD curve to the right. That's what the Fed's trying to do, right? Bring us over to here. What's going to happen to real GDP? It's going to increase. Now, they want an explanation, so here's the thing, guys. AD is made up of C plus I plus G plus net exports, okay? The, there's three of those types of spending I just listed that are interest rate sensitive. Consumption, investment, and net exports. All of them are interest rate sensitive. And all of those types of spending increase when the interest rate goes down. So when the interest rate goes down, real interest rate goes down, consumption's going up, investment's going to go up, and net exports are all going up. AD, again, is shifting to the right, and that will work for an explanation. F, Japan and the United States, our major, major trading partners indicate how the change in real GDP you identified in Part E, remember there was an increase in real GDP, will affect the demand for Japanese yen in the foreign exchange market. Okay, so they want us to just put our blinders on and say, okay, all we're going to look at is the fact there was an increase in real GDP. They say, hey, based on that, what's going to happen in that foreign exchange market? Well, what's happening to U.S. national income? It's going up, right? If we're producing more things of value, our national income is going up. When our national income goes up, we're going to want to buy more of our own stuff, yes, but we're also going to want to buy more of Japanese stuff, okay? We're going to want to buy more of everybody's stuff. Our national income is going up. To buy those Japanese um, goods and services, which would be U.S. imports, right? To buy those goods that J Japan is producing, we got to supply our dollars, okay? And when we supply our dollars, we're going to demand the Japanese yen. So the demand, oops, got the D right there, demand yen. The demand curve for the yen is going to shift to the right, okay? So again, to go buy those goods and services, we're going to supply our dollars. And why, when we supply our dollars to the exchange market, why are we supplying them? To get the yen, demanding the yen. So we're demanding the yen. Once we get the yen, we can go buy those goods and services. All right, so we've got F uh, says, what's going to happen here? The yen is going to appreciate. The yen is going to appreciate. Um, we all, I think it's not even asking that. It just wants us, us to say demand is going to shift to the right. G, draw a correctly label graph, the foreign exchange market for the Japanese yen. We've already done that. Showing the effect of the change in demand, we've done that. On the value of the Japanese relative to the Japanese yen relative to the United States dollar. And guys, that's what that arrow is doing right there, okay? So... We're going to need more dollars to get a yen. We're going to need more dollars to get a yen. That's what it means when we move 
uh, vertically upward on this uh, graph right here. More dollars to get a yen. The yen is for sure appreciating. So the yen's appreciating, and that's showing that the yen is appreciating. And I just probably write it. Yen appreciating. Hope that makes sense to you. Hope you stuck it through that whole video. We'll see you in the next problem.